Have you ever wondered what oligarchs talk about when they think no one is listening? Wonder no more. This week we dissect Eric Schmidt's recent Q&A at Stanford University, where he talks about remote work, the future of AI, and how big tech intervenes at the highest levels of government. Now the kicker is, he thought it was private and didn't realize it was being recorded. And some of the comments regarding the laziness of remote workers and the arrogance of the programming community went viral, prompting him to apologize and then scramble to have the video removed. Now, considering he ran the world's biggest internet search engine and this platform, he probably should have known that nothing ever disappears. But beyond the comments that got the most attention in the media, at least for a minute, the conversation reveals so much more about the dark side of oligarchy in the United States. UNFTR. Students and would-be tech entrepreneurs gathered to hear the sage advice of billionaire Eric Schmidt in an unfiltered conversation about the future of AI. Because Schmidt forgot that it was being filmed and somehow didn't see the camera set up in the small lecture hall until it was pointed out to him, he really let loose. Now, Schmidt doesn't get the normal tech billionaire media treatment like the Zuckerbergs or the Musks of the world. He was just a hired gun at Google at first, brought in because the founders were told they needed an adult at the helm. But Schmidt proved to be a really effective corporate leader during his time at Google. And ever since then, he's joined the ranks of the oligarchy in the United States and, as you'll learn, has his hands in more than just AI startups as an investor these days. Let's start off by listening to the opening parts of the interview where he talks about TikTok as it relates to coding and information. The government is in the process of trying to ban TikTok. We'll see if that actually happens. If TikTok is banned, here's what I propose each and every one of you do. Say to your LLM the following. Make me a copy of TikTok, steal all the users, steal all the music, put my preferences in it, produce this program in the next 30 seconds, release it, and in one hour, if it's not viral, do something different along the same lines. <laughs> That's the command. Boom, 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 right? You understand how powerful that is. If you can go from arbitrary language to arbitrary digital command, which is essentially what Python in this scenario is, imagine that each and every human on the planet has their own programmer that actually does what they want, as opposed to the programmers that work for me who don't do what I ask, right? <laughs> The, the programmers here know what I'm talking about. So imagine a non-arrogant programmer that actually does what you want, and you don't have to pay all that money to. And there's infinite supply of these programs. And this is all within the next year or two. Very soon. And we're off. Who boy. Now, the media fixated on Schmidt's suggestion to just steal TikTok's code and all of its users, which is understandable. Also, the music licensing industry had some thoughts as well. Now, later, he kind of sort of walks back this part of it, but in the process, he digs the hole even deeper, and we'll get to that in a few. But there's obviously a lot more at play here. First is the blatant disregard for intellectual property. I mean, think about what he's suggesting here, and how American companies would respond to programmers in other sovereign jurisdictions making similar commands and ripping off the core architecture of literally every tech platform out there. It would be pandemonium. Also, it's possibly pretty cool if we consider the arguments made by Yanis Varoufakis in Technofeudalism. Make sure to check out our interview with him from a couple months ago because it's really enlightening. And central to Varoufakis' thesis is that the tech companies have created a walled garden of sorts that not only eliminates market competition, but they've foreclosed on access to technology because of profit motives that could otherwise be useful in society. So in one sense, Schmidt is entertaining the notion that within the next year or two, rogue, meaning non-corporate affiliated networks of programmers, will have the technical capability through AI to replicate any platform in the world and iterate upon it to continuously refine, improve, and iterate on it until it becomes something altogether different and maybe even better. As for the legality of this, again, he gets into that later. But what he's theoretically proposing undermines the entire capitalist system and tech infrastructure of the world. I'm kind of okay with that, but also it's a little dystopian, right? And he's kind of celebrating it while also talking shit about the arrogant programmers on whose backs his billions were literally accumulated. And for what? For what? For what? For demanding living wages and pushing back on morally or ethically compromised code? The level of detachment and sheer irresponsibility contained within that clip alone is staggering. 
Because remember, he's talking to students at an elite institution who literally want to be him. So these are the guidelines he's giving the next generation? Just steal everything, apologize for nothing, and abuse your workforce? Let's move on. So you asked about what else is going to happen. Um, every six months, I oscillate. So we're on a, it's an even odd oscillation. <laughs> so at the moment, the gap between the frontier models, of which there are yeah. now only three, I'll review who they are, and everybody else, appears to me to be getting larger. Six months ago, I was convinced that the gap was getting smaller. So I invested lots of money in the little companies. Now I'm not so sure. <laughs> and I'm talking to the big companies, and the big companies are telling me that they need 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion. They're Stargate is a, what, 100 billion, right? It's very, very hard. I talked, Sam Altman is a close friend. He believes that it's going to take about 300 billion, maybe more. I pointed out to him that I'd done the calculation on the amount of energy required. And I, and I then, in the spirit of full disclosure, went to the White House on Friday and told them that we need to become best friends with Canada. Because <laughs> Canada has really nice people, helped invent AI, and lots of hydropower. Mm -hmm. Because we as a country do not have enough power to do this. The alternative is to have the Arabs fund it. And I like the Arabs personally. Uh, I spent lots of time there, right? But they're not going to adhere to our national security rules, whereas Canada and the U.S. are part of a triumvirate where we all agree on. So these $100 billion, $300 billion data centers, electricity starts becoming the scarce resource. The Arabs? How casual. The Arabs have money, but you know, they're Arabs. And don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are Arab. But they're a little light on the whole national security thing, so we'll just go to Canada. They'll do anything we ask of them, and we can even steal their hydropower. Also, and I'm just spitballing here, $300 billion into energy-sucking server farms that increase the capacity of a completely unchecked technology that even the programmers don't fully understand? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? You know, what also struck me here is the sheer amount of money that the investor class has to risk on technology that Schmidt admits shortly is a clear investor bubble, all for the sake of pushing a completely unproven technology on the world as it consumes more and more of our precious resources. And all of these funds, by the way, came from us. They came from the free money government lending programs created under quantitative easing, corporate profiteering, and techno-feudalism style gatekeeping that allowed the corporate class to hoard wealth that could otherwise be circulating through the broader economy. This is the money they're willing to risk, which means it's still just a fraction of the accumulated wealth of the investor class. Now, for context, $300 billion is the GDP of Finland. The pocket change they can afford to risk on technology with unproven ROI, but potentially catastrophic consequences to intellectual property, privacy, and the job market, not to mention the rogue states he mentions that can tap into the technology due to lack of restrictions and guardrails, is the equivalent of some country's gross domestic products. This is where inequality has led. And one of the problems, among many, is that we're wholly incapable of crafting a regulatory framework for how this level of investment can be deployed so as to incur minimal harm to the people and the planet. And here's the nugget that got Schmidt in some hot water with the media. Um, Google decided that work-life balance and going home early and working from home was more important than winning. <laughs> like I said, that was the part that embarrassed Schmidt and grabbed all of the headlines. But this is the Silicon Valley ethos that we celebrate in this country. The entire mantra here is cheat, steal, hustle, and grind. Code your ass off to become a billionaire and apologize later for any harm done along the way. While the rest of the civilized world is contemplating shorter work weeks, labor protections, and regulatory frameworks to protect workers and property, we're actually marching decidedly in the other direction. And the investor class is cheerleading every step of the way because they're under the illusion that this is somehow in our best interests, lest the Chinese catch up to us. It's all so delusional, but this is the mindset of the free market neoliberals. Rather than creating a system that distributes wealth and opportunity to all, it's the tech bro sigma culture of labor theft. Schmidt continues on this line of thinking, by the way. 
And the startups, the reason startups work is because the people work like hell. And I'm sorry to be so blunt, but the fact of the matter is if you all leave the university and go found a company, you're not going to let people work from home and only come in one day a week if you want to compete against the other startups. When, when in the early days of Google, Microsoft was like that. Exactly. But now it seems to be... And there's, a, there's a long history of, in my industry, our industry, I guess, of companies winning in a genuinely creative way and really dominating a space and not making this, the next transition. It's w very well documented. And I think that the truth is founders are special. The founders need to be in charge. The founders are difficult to work with. They push people hard. Um, as much as we can dislike Elon's personal behavior, look at what he gets out of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I had dinner with him, and he was flying. I was in Montana. He was flying that night at 10 p.m. to have a meeting at midnight with X.AI. Right. Think midnight. about it. I was in Taiwan, different country, different culture. And they said that, uh, and this is TSMC, who I'm very impressed with. And they have a rule that the starting PhDs coming out of the, they're good, good physicists, work in the factory on the basement floor. Now, can you imagine getting American physicists to do that? The PhDs, highly unlikely. Different work ethic. And the problem here, the, the reason I'm being so harsh about work is that these are systems which have network effects. So time matters a lot. And in most businesses, time doesn't matter that much, right? You have lots of time. You know, Coke and Pepsi will still be around and the fight between Coke and Pepsi will continue to go on and mm -hmm. it's all glacial, mm -hmm. right? When I dealt with telcos, the typical telco deal would take 18 months to sign, right? There's no reason to take 18 months to do anything. Get it done. Mm -hmm. it's just, it, it, we're in a period of maximum growth, maximum gain. Imagine busting your ass in higher education for a decade or more to achieve a PhD only to have some fuck nugget like Schmidt tell you that you've earned a spot in the basement of some tech company high rise. And he's telling this to a group of Stanford students who are probably on their way to do just that. I mean, he's basically shitting on them before they even get started and telling them that he's rooting for a world in which their hard work is meaningless unless they're willing to commit the hours to stealing other people's IP. And for what? For what? So they can join the elite cabal of jet-setting douchebags like Elon Musk? I mean, you really admire Musk because he took a private jet to have a midnight dinner somewhere? That's your litmus test? So hopefully a picture is starting to emerge that Nowhere in the oligarch thought process are the people who might be affected by their monstrous creations. Anyway, so I guess the reason to treat workers like caged animals and deplete energy sources throughout North America is because of the Chinese, right? Nope. Roll the next clip. We're ahead. We need to stay ahead. And we need lots of money to do so. Our customers were the Senate and the House. Um, and out of that came the CHIPS Act and a lot of other stuff like that. Um, the, a rough scenario is that if you assume the frontier models drive forward and a few of the open source models, it's likely that a very small number of companies can play this game. Countries, excuse me. What are those countries or who are they? Countries with a lot of money and a lot of talent, strong educational systems, and a willingness to win. The U.S. is one of them. China is another one. How many others are there? Are there any others? <laughs> I don't know, maybe, but certainly the, 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 in your lifetimes, the battle between U, the U.S. and China for knowledge supremacy is going to be the big fight, right? So the U.S. government banned uh, essentially the NVIDIA chips, although they weren't allowed to say that was what they were doing, but they actually did that into China. Um, they have about a 10-year chip advantage. We have a, a roughly 10-year chip advantage in terms of sub-DUV, that is sub-5 nanometer 10 chip. years, that long? Roughly 10 years. Wow. Um, and so you're going to have, so an example would be today we're a couple of years ahead of China. My guess is we'll get a few more years ahead of China and the Chinese are whopping mad about this. It's like hugely upset about it. Oh, so we're a decade ahead of China and that's not enough to fight whatever fucking imaginary battle this is for AI supremacy. That's going to somehow democratize coding and potentially spread election misinformation, steal everyone's identity and place military technology into the hands of rogue actors. That's interesting, but it's not really the part I want to point out. 
Did you catch how casually he said that he and the other tech billionaires petitioned Congress to build chip manufacturing in the United States, which led to the Chips and Science Act? Now, listen, the Chips Act was one of the crowning achievements of the Biden administration. It's already supercharged investments into the sector and pretends good things for our domestic manufacturing economy. And it also reduces the probability that we'll ever be stuck with the supply chain snarls that we experienced during the pandemic. But that's not the part I have a problem with. The problem is relational. Who's working for who here? Or is it whom? I don't know. Our system of representation is so fully co-opted by the ruling elites that when they sit before Congress and make requests, they get landmark legislation as a result. It's a real window into how do things get done here. All that red tape, the negotiation and compromise that members of Congress blame for why we can't have nice things, suddenly disappears, depending on who's sitting in front of them. Now, we all know this to be true, but it, at least we suspected it. But I mean, he just said the quiet part out loud, so now we really know. Our elected officials work for the tech oligarchs. Okay, so aside from the war over AI hegemony, are there any other battles being waged by the corporate class? Let's talk to about a real war that's going on. I know that uh, something you've been very involved in is uh, the Ukraine war, and in particular, uh, I don't know how much you can talk about White Stork and, and your your goal of having uh, 500000 dollars drones yeah. destroy five million dollar tanks. So, so, so how's that changing warfare? So I worked for the Secretary of Defense for seven years. And, um, and tried to change the way we run our military. I'm, I'm not a particularly big fan of the military, but it's very expensive, and I wanted to see if I could be helpful. And I think, in my view, I largely failed. They gave me a medal, so they must give medals to failure or, <laughs> you know, whatever. But my self-criticism was nothing has really changed. And the system in America is not going to lead to real innovation. So watching the Russians use tanks to destroy apartment buildings with little old ladies and kids it just drove me crazy. So I decided to work on a company with your friend, Sebastian Thrun, and a num as a former faculty member here, and a whole bunch of Stanford people. And the idea basically is to do two things. Use AI in complicated, powerful ways for these essentially robotic war. And the second one is to lower the cost of the robots. Now you sit there and you go, why would a good liberal like me do that? And the answer is that the whole theory of armies is tanks, artilleries, and mortar, and we can eliminate all of them. I worked for the military, but I'm a good liberal because I wanted to help them, you know, do war better. <laughs> but they didn't listen, so I just decided to start my own military side hustle to show them how we can wage war with robots. I mean, the old way of murdering civilians is just so costly and outdated. I mean, the disconnect here would be laughable if it wasn't so fucking horrifying and delivered in such a nonchalant manner. And we've heard this before from the likes of Peter Thiel and Palantir and Eric Prince or Elon Musk. I mean, these guys talk about warfare and spycraft as though they're in charge. And it's increasingly seeming like maybe they are. So there was an article that you and Henry Kissinger and Dan Huttenlecker uh, wrote last year about the nature of knowledge and how it's evolving. I had a discussion the other night about this as well. So for most of history, humans sort of had a mystical right. understanding of the universe, and then there's the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. Um, and in your article, you argue that now these models are becoming so complicated and uh, uh, difficult to understand that we don't really know what's going on in them. Uh, I'll take a quote from uh, Richard Feynman. He says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. I saw this quote the other day. But now people are creating things they do not, that, that they can create, but they don't really understand what's inside of them. Is the nature of knowledge changing in a way? Are we going to have to start just taking the word for these models without them able, being able to explain well, it to us? The, the analogy I would offer is to teenagers. If you have a teenager... You know they're, they're human, but you can't quite figure out what they're thinking. <laughs> um, but somehow we've managed in society to adapt to the presence of teenagers, right? And they eventually grow out of it. And I'm, I'm just serious. So it's probably the case mm -hmm. that we're going to have knowledge systems that we cannot fully characterize, mm -hmm. but we understand their boundaries, right? We understand the limits of what they can do. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the best outcome we can get. Do you think we'll understand the limits? We'll get pretty good at it. Yeah, but what if we don't? And I'm sorry, but teenagers might be churlish and snarky, 
but I've dealt with them extensively, and they're pretty easy to figure out. It's a horrible analogy, designed to make him seem funny and human, but the lack of humanity in the construct of his thought process is incredibly troubling. The fact that he so thoughtlessly drops the very real fact that they don't understand what they're building, but hope to someday come to understand, should set off warning bells and alarms throughout the halls of Congress to get some goddamn regulations on the books and slow it down. I mean, for the love of God, we're a decade ahead of the Chinese government, right? Just slow the fuck down. Think about what we're unleashing on the world. Maybe have an extended movie-watching session of all the sci-fi movies that have ever been created that really probably predict what comes next. You have to assume that the current hallucination problems become less, right, In as the technology gets better and so forth. I'm not suggesting it goes away. And then you also have to assume that there are tests for efficacy. So there has to be a, a way of knowing that the thing succeeded. So in the example that I gave of the TikTok competitor, and by the way, I was not arguing that you should illegally steal everybody's music. What you would do if you're a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, which hopefully all of you will be, is if it took off, then you'd hire a whole bunch of lawyers to go clean the mess up, right? <laughs> but if, if nobody uses your product, it doesn't matter that you stole all the content. And do not quote me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You're, you're on camera. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but, but you see my point. In other words, Silicon Valley will run these tests and clean up the mess. And that's typically how those things are done. And there it is. The billionaire philosophy. Ask forgiveness, not permission. The halting way in which he responds to being filmed also shows you that somewhere deep in what's left of this guy's soul is a recognition that everything he's saying is really dangerous. There is a belief in the market that the invention of intelligence has infinite return. So let's say you, have, you put $50 billion of capital into a company. You have to make an awful lot of money from intelligence to pay that back. So it's probably the case that we'll go through some huge investment bubble, and then it'll sort itself out. That's always been true in the past, and it's likely to be true here. So what if the investor class gets burned when the AI investment bubble bursts, right? I mean... They can't always be winners, and it's likely that the big guys are going to win the day anyway and consolidate their interests. So there's going to be a massive amount of blood in the streets among investors when the ROI just doesn't show up in their portfolios from this AI gambit. But so what, right? I mean, they lost their shirts in 2000, again in 2008, and they wind up coming back bigger than ever because we just bailed them out. That's one way of looking at it, right? But then there's the concept of opportunity cost. So if we're 10 years ahead of the next closest competitor, if we're likely to burn hundreds of billions of dollars of investment capital, if we run a high risk of creating a monster we can't control in service of massive upside potential for a handful of tech billionaire investors, if we increasingly deplete our natural resources in the vague and dangerous pursuit of who knows what, then the question is, what's the opportunity cost associated with this? right? What could these dollars and this time and this investment otherwise have done to improve our lives instead of potentially maybe enriching a handful with the vague promise that it might maybe someday make things a little better for everyone, but only after we've learned to cope with the devastation that we've wrought from it. And what we're thinking out loud, is there anything else that could go wrong along the way? How can we stop AI from influencing public opinion, misinformation, especially during the upcoming election? What are the short and long-term solutions from? Most of the misinformation in this upcoming election and globally will be on social media. And the social media companies are not organized well enough to police it. If you look at TikTok, for example, there are lots of accusations that TikTok is favoring one kind of misinformation over another. And there are many people who claim without proof that, that I'm aware of that the Chinese are forcing them to do it. I think we just, we have a mess here. And um, the country is going to have to learn critical thinking. Uh, that may be an, an impossible challenge for the U.S. But, but the fact that somebody told you something does not mean that it's true. I think that the, the greatest threat to democracy is misinformation because we're going to get really good at it. Um, when I ran, man, managed YouTube, the biggest problems we had on YouTube were that people would upload false videos and people would die as a result. And we had a no death policy. They have no good answer for this. Quote, the country is going to have to learn critical thinking. 
of all the patronizing bullshit that this guy stuffed into a half hour presentation, this might be the most callously offhanded, not my problem kind of response. We're going to make a mess here. It's your responsibility to figure out what's real and what's not, what's safe and what's dangerous. I mean, this is what dystopia looks like. This is Orwell and Huxley collaborating on a script and filmed by Tarantino and Kubrick. Now look, I know for many of you, this isn't necessarily enlightening. This is the world that we've come to understand together through doing the work on Unfucking the Republic as an example. But it does let you know that it's real. You're not losing your mind. They're the ones that have lost their minds. And as we gnash our teeth and point fingers at one another, settle into our confirmation biases and our election tribes, it's also a really good reminder of who the real enemy of the people is. They want you distracted and agitated. They want you to have just enough to eke out an existence, but stressed enough that you can't take a moment to think for yourself. Because if we all had that luxury and were exposed to the words and actions of monsters like Eric Schmidt, there would be a revolution in the streets. And they know that. And so they're working toward a future where a handful of billionaires like Schmidt, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, control the information that we see and hear. They control who we bomb and how and which country's natural resources we're gonna plunder. Huh, now that I think about it, maybe we're not the ones that should be worried. I mean, those things, that's what the politicians do. They're the ones whose jobs are going away. Here endeth the lesson. Hey, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel because it really helps us in the algorithm, especially because we don't take any money from Russian disinformation campaigns. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, sign them all, sign them all. Also, don't forget to sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can do that at unftr.com. And while you're there, you can browse our directory of progressive resources, read the progressive spotlight of the week, check out any of the news articles and essays that we've written over the years. All of the things can be found at unftr.com. Thank you to the following members for supporting our work.